Well, it's great to be here to discuss the STS-132 launch countdown status. Uh, before I get into that, I just want to commend all the teams that support the space shuttle program here at Kennedy Space Center, across the country and, and around the world. Uh, you know, these teams have done an outstanding job getting Atlantis, the external tank, our solid rocket boosters, our payload, and all our ground facilities ready to support the SGS-132 launch and mission. We've had a very clean countdown so far, and we're currently on schedule, and we're not working any, uh, working any issues. The clock is currently holding at T minus 11 hours, and that's a planned built-in 13 hour and 55 minute hold. Last night we completed the loading of our onboard cryogenic reactants for our fuel cells. Uh, we currently have four days of LH2 and 11 days of LO2 pad hold time. There are, se there are several operations in work at the pad this morning. Uh, teams are busy retracting access platforms and configuring the pad for launch. The checkout of our orbiter and ground communications network uh, is planned for 11.30 this morning. At 5.30 p.m., the rotating service structure will be retracted and we'll continue doing our final closeouts for launch. At 7 p.m., we'll perform our ascent switch list. And just before 10 p.m., the countdown clock will resume counting at T minus 11 hours. We'll then begin our final external tank loading preparations and start clearing the pad just before midnight. Our shuttle managers will meet at 4.15 a.m. tomorrow morning for our tanking weather briefing set up prior to our external tank load. Hopefully Todd will give us uh, some good news about the weather and uh, we'll proceed with external tank loading at 4.55 a.m. Flight crew will arrive at the pad and begin, the, begin their e ingress uh, to the vehicle at 11 a.m. Our launch window for tomorrow is approximately 10 minutes in length and will open at 2.15 p.m. And we typically target the middle of the window, which correlates to just after 2.20 2 p.m. Uh, as far as our mission goes, it's a 12-day 12, 12 mission, zero contingency days, and two weather contingency days. And our end of mission landing is planned for KSC at 8.44 a.m. on Wednesday, May 26th. As far as our scrub turnaround plans go, uh, we have enough onboard fuel cell reactants to get four launch attempts in five days, and that's using our standard 24- and 48-hour uh, scrub turnaround uh, options. We do have launch opportunities through May 18th, and at that point, we run, we run into a conflict with the range reconfiguration for the Delta IV GPS launch that's scheduled for May 20th. To summarize, the countdown is proceeding very well, and we're not tracking any issues. The hard work and dedication of everyone involved with SGS-132 has gotten us to this point, and all our systems are go to proceed with the work that remains in launch countdown, and we're looking forward to a spectacular launch tomorrow afternoon at 2.20. Thanks. Thank you. Robbie. Okay, good morning. Uh, let's see, I'll start with a quick status uh, on the payloads, and uh, then we have a little bit of video that we'll uh, run through. Uh, let's see, for the payloads, this is uh, actually uh, one of the more enjoyable uh, parts of the flow for us. Uh, our payloads uh, have been uh, installed in the payload bay and are safely tucked away. Uh, the payload bay doors were closed uh, uh, this past uh, Tuesday. Uh, so the primary payloads, the MRM-1 module, uh, the Russian module, and the uh, ICC carrier uh, have been in there with the doors closed. We, um, the only other activity that we have uh, uh, to go is uh, the loading of the uh, research, the late stow experiments, and our team is um, just about right now uh, preparing uh, to go and, and uh, take receipt of those uh, uh, late stow experiments from the uh, uh, research uh, teams and uh, then get those out to the pad and, and turn them over for installation into the uh, crew compartment mid-deck and those should be installed by uh, later this afternoon. Um, so payloads, uh, we're not working any issues. It's been a, a very uh, uh, good uh, final uh, flow at the pad. Um, uh, we get to at this point uh, now that the payload bay doors are closed kind of exhale and relax a little and uh, and uh, watch the uh, launch team do their thing. Uh, uh, and we look forward to uh, tomorrow's launch uh, and weather is still looking good. Um, we're excited uh, for our Russian uh, partners uh, who have been here, the, the Energia team have been here since uh, December uh, with their module getting it ready uh, to go. And um, so we're excited for them that, uh, uh, that we're at here at the eve of uh, launching their module 
uh, to the station. And it will be, uh, not only is it the first Russian module to uh, be launched or flown to station on the shuttle, it will be the last also, uh, so a first and a last. Um, and so we're looking forward to that. Uh, there's uh, the mission uh, itself is uh, going to be very exciting. There's uh, uh, three EVAs uh, activities as well as um, a lot of robotics operations, including the installation of the uh, MRM-1 module uh, on the station uh, that's on flight day five. Uh, so we uh, you know, sit back, uh, relax a little today, get the uh, payload experiments uh, loaded, and then uh, be out here tomorrow for, uh, for the launch, and then uh, get to watch uh, things as they unfold on orbit. Um, Let's see, that's it for status. Uh, if we could, I believe we've got a short video that I'll uh, walk through. Okay, this is uh, back in December out at the shuttle landing facility, and that's the Antonov uh, 124 uh, heavy lift cargo aircraft bringing the MRM-1 module uh, from Moscow here to the United States. Uh, this was on December 17th. Uh, you're looking at the uh, transportation uh, container being offloaded, gets uh, transferred uh, to a um, flatbed, and then from there was uh, taken off center and over to uh, Astrotech um, at the port uh, for their final launch site preparations. There you see uh, technicians, or as the uh, Russians call them, specialists uh, loading uh, cargo into the module, and now they're preparing the uh, the uh, module to uh, for hatch closure. It is uh, uh, launching uh, 1,400 kilograms or just over 3,000 pounds of U.S. cargo inside the module. And now they are closing the hatch. And this is just days before uh, bringing it uh, back on center to the space station processing facility. These uh, red covers are protective covers that get removed just before going into our payload canister. And now they are uh, preparing it for shipment. Uh, they're on air bearing uh, casters right now, uh, taking it over to where it will be loaded into its uh, shipping container. And these are actually AstroTech uh, technicians um, uh, loading the module into the shipping container. So they set it on this uh, blue cradle and the uh, container cover gets installed over the top. Now we're in the uh, space station processing facility we're looking at the uh, module being installed into the uh, our payload canister. You can see the red protective covers uh, had been removed. That's the uh, one of the grapple fixtures. That's the one the uh, space station arm will take the handoff from the uh, shuttle's arm during the uh, mating operations. And this is uh, uh, the integrated cargo carrier uh, two days later on April 7th being loaded into the payload canister. You're looking at the six um, batteries that will be installed on the uh, P6 and you see the uh, KU band antenna uh, uh, on the front of the carrier. Now our uh, payload canister is being rotated from horizontal to vertical uh, just before going out to the pad. So we take it um, rotate it to vertical and set it back down on the same uh, transporter. And now it's vertical and uh, ready for the trip to the pad. And uh, this is April 15th uh, in the evening uh, on the way out to the launch pad, passing the VAB and the launch control center in the background. Now we're back in the uh, space station processing facility uh, downstairs in our offline laboratories as the uh, some of the research teams are doing their final preparations of their experiments uh, for this flight. Uh, what you're looking at there is actually sterilization of uh, rice seeds uh, being prepared for the JAXA's um, called a ferrolate uh, experiment. And then these, uh, these are some of the rice seeds that are, uh, will be flown up. And this particular experiment is um, it's called fish scales. And there's more information in the uh, press kit, but uh, they, they, these are scales that are harvested from uh, uh, goldfish and we're studying um, basically these are regenerative scales and they'll be studying um, uh, looking at uh, bone loss and atrophy. Now we are uh, back to this week 
earlier on the 11th with the final uh, closing of the Palo Bay doors. And this is uh, for the payload team again. This is at the moment where we kind of let out a big exhale and, and uh, can relax a little and uh, turn our sights to uh, launch day. So the doors are closed and um, I'd like to echo what uh, Jeremy said in complimenting uh, the various teams in getting uh, not only the shuttle but the, uh, the um, uh, payloads ready for this flight. Uh, it was a challenging uh, flow for the shuttle team, uh, you know, right on the heels of STS-131 and uh, getting the pad turned around and then uh, the orbiter out there. It's, uh, it's been uh, a, um, a lot of activity here in the last uh, two, three weeks. Uh, but. Uh, the orbiter team, shuttle team has done a fantastic job in uh, taking care of us as well, getting our payloads installed, and uh, we're just excited for the launch uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Todd? Good morning. I do have some good weather, as far good news as far as the weather <coughs> is concerned. Uh, we've had high pressure over us for the past few days, and that high pressure has stayed firm. And uh, we're expecting that to stay over the top of Florida at least until Sunday. If we take a look at the satellite picture, you can see virtually cloud-free skies over Florida. And along the coast, there are some low clouds out over the water, and they are moving on shore. And uh, most of the nasty weather uh, is well out to our north and west with that real strong high-pressure system over the top of us. It's going to remain well to our north and west throughout uh, the count, and even Saturday and Sunday if we would happen to, to need those days. As far as the next uh, 24 hours, we're looking for that high pressure center to actually be to our north. That's going to move some of those clouds that are offshore onshore. So we'll see brief periods of partly cloudy skies, easterly winds, and overall pretty dry conditions. As far as the tanking forecast tomorrow, we will be looking at those scattered skies. We may have a brief isolated shower right along the coast kind of move through. But overall, light easterly winds, scattered skies, and pretty dry conditions for tanking operations. We're not looking at any uh, constraints or any constraints to be violated by weather conditions at all. As far as the launch for tomorrow afternoon, we're looking for those scattered skies once again. Uh, winds will be out of the east peaking at 18 knots. One thing I am a little concerned with that I'm watching is uh, if we get some additional low-level convergence, we could see some of those areas of clouds be fairly large and uh, if there's some larger low clouds kind of move into our area like yesterday afternoon, we could see a low cloud ceiling. So because of those low cloud ceilings, I'm looking at a 30% chance of weather prohibiting launch here at KSC. As far as uh, SRB recovery operations, the area is going to be looking uh, pretty nice out there also. Scattered skies right underneath that high pressure system. Winds are going to be more out of the southeast, rather light, and uh, sea state's only three to four feet. So good weather conditions for that operation also. As far as CONUS operations for abort landing site. The Space Flight Meteorology Group is forecasting clear skies out at Edwards and scattered skies out at White Sands and winds will be out of the southwest at both locations rather light. As far as the overseas landing sites, SMG is forecasting broken skies at 5,000 feet at Zaragoza and a chance of showers within 20 nautical miles and uh, showers at Istris also within 20 nautical miles. However, Marone looking good with broken skies at 7,000 feet and light winds, so Marone looking good for, uh, for tomorrow afternoon. As far as a 24-hour slip forecast, we're still looking for that high-pressure system to bring in some low clouds into our area, so scattered skies at 3,000 feet. And uh, we're also looking at, still looking at that same weather pattern, so we could still see some larger areas of clouds move in, giving us a brief ceiling. And because of that, the probability of weather prohibiting launch here at KSC is at 30% for that day also. The CONUS uh, sites are also looking good, few at 25,000 feet and few clouds are at Edwards and a few clouds at uh, White Sands. Overall, no problems with the weather conditions at either one of those sites. As far as our Tau sites overseas, still looking for showers in the area at Zaragoza and a ceiling at 4,000 feet. And we're also looking at winds strengthening up at Istris. However, Marone still looks good for Saturday operations. In the event of a 48-hour slip, we're going to see the upper level ridge start to break down a little bit on, on uh, Sunday. And uh, with that, we'll see some more clouds coming in at the higher levels. And we'll still see low-level winds out of the east. 
So with those two conditions, we're looking for scattered skies at 3,000, broken skies at 25,000, and overall pretty nice conditions uh, on Sunday. As far as the CONUS of Mort sites, still looking for good conditions at both locations. And as far as the overseas site, Zaragoza and Marone both look good. We will still have some gusty surface winds at Istris causing problems with the headwinds. So overall, we're looking at really good conditions for uh, launch operations. That high pressure system has been very friendly to us and uh, bringing us real nice conditions for, for the month of May. And uh, right now we're looking at a 30% chance of KSC violating weather constraints both Friday, Saturday, and even Sunday. Kendria? Thank you. We'll now take questions. When the microphone comes your way, please state your name, affiliation, and to whom you're addressing your question. I'll start with Chris. Um, Chris Gebhardt with NASASpaceflight.com uh, with one for Jeremy and one for Robbie. Um, for Jeremy, um, what is the current uh, launch time tomorrow down to the second that you have uh, for the latest opportunity? Right now I'm tracking 2.20 and 8 seconds. Uh, and for Robbie, um, in terms of the late stow experiments that are going on today, um, can you talk a little bit about what some of those are and uh, what type of turnaround time you have on that should we find ourselves in a scrub turnaround situation? Sure. Uh, let's see. There's several of the experiments are, are JAXA-sponsored uh, experiments. Um, the one or two actually that I mentioned uh, during the video, the fish scales um, uh, and the uh, ferrolate uh, experiment. Ferrolate is, is studying um, basically the effects of uh, microgravity, uh, spaceflight on, on the cellular wall structure of uh, these, in this case, the rice seeds. But um, and they also have a third uh, the hydrotropy uh, experiment that's uh, looking at um, using a moisture gradient uh, uh, as a control mechanism for, uh, for uh, plant growth on orbit or in the microgravity environment uh, where you have a lack of um, uh, gravity and generally uh, plants on, on, on Earth, uh, their root structure uh, grows uh, towards gravity. Uh, without that, it kind of tends to go in all different directions, and they're trying to control that, so they're looking at using moisture uh, gradient uh, as a control mechanism for, for that. Uh, so in addition to the uh, JAXA experiments, and, and all of those will be transferred over and, uh, and conducted in their um, experiment uh, laboratory on orbit. Um, there's a couple of uh, National Lab Pathfinder um, experiments. Uh, one is a cells experiment, just looking at um, replication of, uh, of cells uh, in the microgravity environment, trying to improve techniques. And the other is uh, one of the series of um, the vaccine uh, experiments, looking at basically at, at pathogens and developing uh, vaccines for various pathogens. Uh, this is the ninth, I believe, in, the, in that series of experiments to be flown. Um, in addition, there's, uh, there's um, several other, there's a lot of science that's, uh, that's going up um, and as well that we're actually, in addition to the ones we're taking up, some of it stays, some of it uh, goes up and comes back, a sortie flight. And, and then there's also a, a lot of science that we're bringing home that's been up there and, and undergoing um, uh, you know, research experiments, uh, actually some of it since uh, last November. Uh, so, um, so it's, even though we don't have a, um, one of the logistics modules that, that typically uh, uh, brings a lot of science with it. Uh, there is a lot of science on this flight uh, going up and coming back. Uh, and I have more details I could provide you, uh, or there's more in the press kit as well. Marsha. I'm sorry, I just want to, uh, the, the final launch T0, we'll, we'll come up with that at the T minus nine minute hold and, and we'll get that out to everybody. Sorry. Thank you. Marsha. Um, Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. Um, first for Mr. Ashley, do you have a number of Russians in town for the launch? Do you know estimated how many are here? Uh, well, total I do not know. I, I do, we've primarily been working with the uh, Energia team that, that was um, uh, responsible for the MRM-1 module itself. Um, so about right now there's probably about 30 or so roughly of the Energia team. Uh, uh, this is much smaller than the numbers, obviously, when they were actively uh, preparing their module. But um, I don't have a good number in terms of uh, other, uh, like Roscosmos, Russian Space Agency um, visitors. But I know that there will be, uh, uh, you know, an another fairly large contingent of Roscosmos uh, um, visitors as well, obviously, for the launching of their module. Um, thank you. And for Mr. Graber, would you anticipate trying 
if all things are equal and you don't get off tomorrow, would you probably just do two, stand down and do two more, or could you conceive doing three in a row, or what, what's your going in ideas? Uh, again, the launch director has that prerogative to look at the, the de day of launch uh, conditions. If we were to have that 24-hour scrub turnaround and we had to go into another scrub, uh, we would talk about it. There are several factors that, that play into that decision, but we're going to do the smart thing. Uh, we'll look at uh, the, the crew rest for the, the folks on console. Uh, we'll look at all those different factors and uh, make an assessment and then decide from that point on. But our, our baseline plan would be to do a 24-hour scrub turnaround followed by a 48-hour scrub turnaround. Robert. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com uh, with a question for Robbie. In regards to this being the uh, first and I guess last Russian module, can you um, explain why it differs from the uh, Perota docking module that was launched in 1995 to Mir uh, that was also Energia built on the shuttle? Thanks. Well, that, uh, that of course, was a, uh, another Russian module, but, um, and, but that one, as you mentioned, uh, was uh, destined for the Mir space station. So when I say the first and the last, I meant the first and the last uh, launched on the shuttle to the International Space Station. Clara. Clara Moskowitz with space.com, and this is also for Mr. Ashley. Uh, you mentioned the 1,400 kilograms of U.S. cargo. Could you just uh, give a little bit more idea of what that cargo is? Sure. It's a it's a mixed bag, so to speak, but um, there's uh, a lot of it is uh, crew provisions, um, food, uh, other crew supplies. There, there are uh, you know, some of it is station hardware. Uh, there's um, uh, some replacement parts uh, for some of the components on orbit, uh, including uh, the uh, Sabatier um, uh, uh, that was launched on STS-131. There's some spares for it, um, and there's you know lithium hydroxide, oxygen canisters. Uh, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. There's, there's several uh, laptop computers that are going up. Uh, uh, I can give you further details uh, afterwards. Ken. Uh, for Robbie, um, pretty much to follow up on that question, uh, Mike Moses said that this module was pretty, pretty packed. Are, the, are these, uh, can you describe that, how, how packed it is? And, and, and uh, are, are these components on the inside the shuttle bags, and are there any science experiments also on uh, MRM-1? Okay, so the first part of that, uh, as far as how packed, it, it is very tightly packed. Um, you know, one of the things they will have to do bef uh, is, is uh, before they're able to use the module for its um, you know, primary mission is to unload all of the cargo. There's just not enough room to work uh, in there with the bags installed. So there are bags installed on uh, around either uh, side port and starboard as well as down what we call the center aisle uh, so it is um, it is very tightly packed in the module um, and as far as uh, experiments uh, flying on it there's uh, there's no um, like experiment uh, samples or anything but there is some experiment hardware that is being uh, taken up inside the module to support some of the uh, experiments that are that are um, up there now, as well as uh, some of the supporting hardware for the National Lab Pathfinders that are flying up on this mission. Did I get all parts of your question? Or sure. James. Thanks, James. Dean from Florida Day Free there. Jeremy or Robbie, just wondered if you could comment on the significance of this flight, not just from an Atlantis perspective, but uh, on the capability that you're going to be adding to space station with uh, you know only a few few more flights before you, you can call the U.S. segment at least uh, assembly complete. I'm going to start with Atlantis and then I'll... Sure. Uh, you know, every, every space shuttle flight is, uh, is, is an amazing feat. There's a huge number of people that are involved and um, put a whole lot of hard work and heart and, and effort into it. So each one of these is, a, is an amazing feat and, and we, you know, care about each one exactly the same. And, you know, we're we're happy to have Atlantis be ready to go, and the teams are all ready to go. And as far as significance uh, for the uh, the payloads uh, and what that will bring to the station, of course, the primary payload and the primary objective is is the launching of the uh, MRM-1, 
and it uh, it's a it's a mini research module. So after all of the cargo that's inside uh, is um, uh, removed, uh, they they will um, transfer some uh, experiment racks workstations uh, into it, and so they they it will be able to perform um, science in these um, workstations, as well um, as the module once docked uh, to the station it's docked to the uh, uh, Zarya or FGB module um, so it's it'll be taking a permanent residence there on that docking port and uh, but it will be its aft end will also serve as the, uh, a replacement um, or the fourth uh, docking port on the Russian segment so future um, uh, Soyuz and Progress vehicles will be uh, able to dock there uh, as one of the four uh, Russian segment ports um, and then also, I haven't talked a whole lot about it, but uh, kind of riding up piggyback uh, on the MRM-1 are several of the uh, outfitting components for a later uh, Russian module, the uh, uh, multi-purpose uh, laboratory module, MLM, uh, which I believe uh, is uh, scheduled to be launched in the fall of uh, 2012, uh, although don't hold me to that. But uh, there's the uh, equipment airlock uh, that's prominently uh, featured there on the back of the MRM-1. So this uh, airlock will be used for transferring equipment um, uh, from inside to out. Uh, it also has the uh, radiator, which will be used for cooling of the uh, MLM module. And uh, there's a, a spare uh, elbow for the European or ESA robotic arm uh, that is also uh, mounted and going up. So that, uh, that will, um, like I said, it's a spare, but um, so if needed, it'll uh, uh, be used uh, for the ESA robot arm uh, in, in doing the transfer of these items from the MRM-1 over to the MLM once it arrives, uh, as well as you know, future um, robotic activities. Uh, and then there is a portable uh, workstation uh, for crew member, uh, EBA crew, uh, that's, that's uh, flown on the exterior and will be available for uh, supporting uh, Russian EBAs in the future. Thanks, and uh, for Todd, um, just wondered if, you know, with this possible low cloud cover that could, could develop, is that something you're, you're likely to see coming well before launch time, or is it something that, you know, would happen kind of quickly and you just have to kind of get lucky in that 10 minute window? For the most part, we're gonna be able to see those clouds coming. Uh, they're gonna be out off, offshore, and we'll be watching on satellite, and we'll have observers stationed in different, uh, different areas watching for the clouds to come in. So we'll be able to see on satellite those move in and, and verify that they're moving in uh, with our ground observations. But we'll be able to see them tomorrow morning. As soon as we get that visible satellite picture, we'll start to see those clouds and see where they're at. Irene. I, Irene Klotz with Reuters. Um, on the clouds, is that a TAL um, issue or is that also for visibility for range safety? That's a range safety issue. Uh, the, the range is required to be able to see the, uh, the vehicle take off and also go through the clouds and come out the top of the clouds. So that's why we have those range safety requirements. Okay, and over here in the front row, please. Peter I would Southern FM in Australia. A question for Mr. Graber. Um, on the last mission discovery, uh, there was a fairly large piece of tile liberated from the tail section. And I just uh, wondered if there was a reason for that. Was it a debris strike or a failure of the attachment? Um, and w if there's any actions as following that? Well, for uh, Atlantis, we've gone and inspected all of those similar tiles and uh, feel that they're, we've done everything we can to look at those and understand that they're in good shape. Um, there are no issues with those tiles whatsoever. Um, they're continuing to look at the um, discoveries tiles and under, try and understand exactly what happened. Um, there have been the right folks have gotten together. Um, several teams have been put together to go look at that. Um, they've looked at it from many different angles and some of that data is still uh, in work but there's there's no issue with Atlantis's uh, tiles and, and Atlantis is ready to go. And a question for Mr. Ashley. Um, I believe there was uh, an issue a little while ago identified on the MRM-1 uh, module where some paint was flaking off. Was that resolved, an issue or something done there to address that? 
Yes, it has been uh, resolved, and it's um, it's the thermal protective coating on the radiator. Uh, that, that there were some flakes that were uh, found liberated uh, after we uh, transferred uh, out to the launch pad, rotated to vertical, and, and got out to the launch pad. And during our transfer operations, uh, some of these uh, flakes uh, were noted. Uh, we, of course, you know, pulled together the technical communities, both on the Russian side and and our side, to talk about it. This. Uh, coating is very similar, almost identical to the thermal coating that, that we use on our uh, U.S. built radiators. So we're very familiar with the um, material properties of it. And um, uh, basically, in summary, the, the assessment was that, uh, you know, this was, uh, uh, this liberation uh, was an, in the local, very uh, small percentage of the area, less than 0.2 percent uh, of where it was being liberated from. It is uh, coming from an area that had undergone some repair or touch-up work uh, at the AstroTech facility. Uh, and it's a very, uh, this material, it's, a, it's, it's very uh, difficult to do repairs. Um, and so that's, you know, the, the thoughts there were that, um, you know, it just had become debonded in, in this small repair area. Uh, but the overall assessment is that it's uh, it's not an issue from a thermal perspective, and all of the um, the uh, delaminated um, um, material had been has been removed, uh, so it's all ready to go. No further questions. Well, that will conclude the L minus one countdown status briefing. As Jeremy mentioned, the rotating service structure will be moved away from Space Shuttle Atlantis tonight at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. That will be shown on NASA television. Please join us tomorrow morning for live launch coverage that will begin at 4.45 a.m. with tanking commentary. For more information on the STS-132 mission and crew, visit www.nasa.gov shuttle. Thank you.